So welcome everyone uh, in the open education community to the second of our fall 2018 webinars from the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. Uh, I'm Matthew Bloom. I am English faculty at Scottsdale Community College in uh, the Phoenix area in Arizona, and I am um, on the uh, CCC OER Executive Council, serving in the capacity as uh, um, helping with professional development. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, have some folks here today to talk about their experiences with uh, sustainability in open educational resources. And uh, we will hopefully have some really interesting discussions and I wanna to try to get as many um, uh, responses and questions from the community as well. So we've set aside some specific time for that. So our specific agenda for today uh, is just to kind of do some uh, some very basic introduction um, and then give an overview of CCC OER. Um, the introductions, please uh, take a look at the chat because I know that a lot of folks have already uh, gone through and, and, um, and introduced themselves in there. And after that, we have our round table. That'll be the, the main part of it. And then uh, following that, we'll just kind of let you know what's going on at our next webinar, and then we'll be done. So let's go ahead and get started, because I think that we will have more than enough stuff to talk about today. So just in case you are um, you need a reminder, I guess, about CCC OER, if you're not familiar with the organization, um, the mission of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources is to, as it says here, expand awareness and access to high quality quality OER. Um, I think that, you know, this is a, you know, it's a community based effort. It's a, a lot of collaboration. We want to do the best we can to support faculty. Um, and uh, you know, that's why we exist as a consortium is to be there to do what we can to help you as members, um, you know, in whatever kind of open education goals you have. So um, it was really especially a, a it's, a, it's kind of a privilege to be able to uh, to help when possible. Um, and of course, improving student success is always uh, the ultimate goal for those things. And our membership um, is, uh, we have membership in a number of different places, 30 different states, 70 members total. And, um, whoops. And uh, so, you know, you can see that we've got a lot um, spread out across the country, but obviously there's still room for expansion, so. So let's just get to our discussion for today. Uh, the round table we have, we have some pretty distinguished speakers today. Um, well, maybe two out of three. The first one's me, but um, the, so yeah, that's me. I'm the OER coordinator, faculty and residence coordinator for the Maricopa County Colleges in Arizona. We also have Quill <coughs> West, who is the open education project manager um, and OER degree director at Pierce College District in Washington. And she is the uh, president of the CCC OER Executive Council. And then we have Nathan Smith, who is uh, also the OER coordinator, faculty in residence, uh, and philosophy faculty at Houston Community Colleges in Texas. And so without further ado, I think that we can just go ahead and, and start. I think that uh, the initial idea was to kind of premise the entire discussion with a definition of sustainability that really focused it, uh, kind of comes from the ecological um, understanding of sustainability, which is, uh, as it says here, the ability of a system to remain diverse and produce indefinitely. And in a sense, I think I'm going to be paraphrasing what um, what I heard Quill say yesterday when we were speaking, um, is the idea that, you know, we're leaving a, the system there for whoever is going to take over after us. Um, and so it is very, um, very much about thinking forward, thinking about the future, not just successes in the moment, but also uh, successes in uh, the future and trying to keep that going. So how do we do it? Because, you know, we work really hard and we try to build this stuff, but, you know, if, if there aren't certain maybe policies or infrastructural things in place or financial decisions in place, then it might be difficult to keep it going. So. I'm going to not talk a lot. What I want to do is, uh, is like I said, kind of just open this up. And so this first one here, uh, the, the, there's three categories. And after each of the three topics, uh, we'll open up for uh, a little bit of discussion from the community. The first topic is the financial aspect of sustainability. 
And so Quill and Nathan, um, wh whichever one of you is interested in, in starting, uh, maybe we'll just go with Quill since you were uh, the next one in the list there. So the, the first question is, what financial models have you implemented for sustaining OER at your institution? Hi, everyone. Thank you. And I apologize if my voice is quiet. I have a bit of a cold. Um, so uh, financial models, I think you have to start with the discussion of what budget models can be reallocated to support what you're currently doing. So for example, at my institution, um, the leadership role, meaning my role, <laughs> is really, um, really important to the ongoing um, use of OER at our institution and the integration of OER into our institutional court, um, culture. So we have reallocated some of the fees we already collect from the um, student e-learning fee to pay my salary, um, which you know I'm very grateful for. But beyond that, it gives us a little bit of flexibility in how OER work gets done because the leadership for OER is not tied to um, specific grants that we might be seeking and those kinds of things that we might go seeking for to pay faculty stipends. Um, so that was one of our first big kind of institutional changes in budgeting to support OER at our institution. All right, well, thank you very much, Quill. And Nathan, did you want to um, add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, so <clears throat> our uh, financial model, basically we started with a, uh, a grant, um, but as part of that grant process, we had to demonstrate that um, we were matching the external funds with internal funds. And so what that forced us to do was to actually uh, create budget line items that supported the OER effort. Um, so these are coming out of the general funds for academic instruction. Um, and we currently have a budget for an OER, an OER budget line. And that budget includes um, uh, the full release, the release time for my position, um, which is a faculty position that, that uh, and I get a full release for that. Um, I have a part-time administrative assistant and I've also just added a, um, a single course release for an additional faculty member to, to assist me with some things. We have a small budget for faculty training stipends, a small budget for travel, supplies, and marketing. So the grand total on that is not a, it's not a big budget, but it, there are lines for each of these things. And um, one of the things that's useful is, is, is if you can create a line for the OER in your in your budget that sort of thing kind of tends to roll over and it has a kind of institutional inertia it's harder to get rid of existing budget lines than it is to create um new ones i think that's uh, a i think that's a very uh important point uh is that you know once you've got it in there then you know you can hopefully uh, rely on that being there for a while i just wanted to ask you nathan um to what extent do you do you feel confident that the support from your institution is going to continue um, you know indefinitely uh, now that you have the line in the budget um, if you know grant funding starts to run out and things like that then um, you know what, what does that look like for for in your situation yeah so we're um, that's an ongoing conversation that we're having I think um, I'm, I'm the current leadership that we have in place, uh, my the person I report to is really supportive of OER, and as is um, the the vice chancellor of instruction, who's kind of the head chief academic officer. Um, and so I have confidence that that'll continue, but yeah, the conversation we're having right now is sort of how to transition some of the things that are coming out of the grant um, to other revenue streams. So, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about things like potentially a fee or reallocating resources from other areas um, to support, the, to support um, things like faculty stipends, um, things like um, partnerships with uh, third parties that provide courseware support, that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, so, but I, I think that the current... The, my current budget will probably continue. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty confident in that. 
Excellent. Um, so, and, and Quill, I, I really wanted to touch on something that you had said about, um, you know, kind of the core idea is, is that the position that you have and the OER support that you have is kind of uh, the result of the repurposing of existing fees. And I think that that fits uh, also into a discussion that we're going to have in a in a moment here about how to embed uh, the open education work into the existing in infrastructure or the institutional structure that exists. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll touch back on that, but I was wondering if there was anybody in the community who had any questions um, related specifically to the financial aspect of sustainability at this point that we might be able to um, address. Anyone? Okay, well, what we can do, if you do have those questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat window and um, we will see if we have time at the end, we should have time at the end uh, to address them. So I'll just go ahead and move on to the next thing. So um, after the financial uh, sustainability, the idea is, is that we have, um, like I said, there, there is this kind of infrastructural sustainability, which is related to a lot of the, the work that you do in terms of policy. So the next question that I have is, you know, what policy considerations are necessary to support OER sustainability. So either Nathan or Quill, whomever is interested in, in addressing that, there's some suggested kind of subtopics there, but go ahead. Oh, I'll go first. Um, so I think probably most importantly, and, and maybe at my institution most difficult to talk about is intellectual property policies um, in terms of faculty generated work, but also in terms of just institutionally created work and ownership of it and changing a traditional model around what intellectual property means at the institution. Um, for us, that was a contract negotiation as well as an ongoing conversation with kind of our risk management folks around what does it mean when we share our intellectual property and, and what are the challenges to our institutions if we do. Um, so I'd like to start with that conversation because I think for us, that started our all of our policy conversations. It started, when we started with intellectual property, it kind of led to some conversations around what OER means at our institution. Excellent. Nathan, did you have any, um, any experiences with intellectual property policy at Houston? Yeah, um, so I'm, we're working on changing our intellectual property policy right now. Uh, we, um, <clears throat> so on, we were, we actually had a really good intellectual property policy that was written, I think, around 2011, 2012, um, by uh, and by some a couple of people who had been involved in the OER effort. So there was there was like it was OER was listed in the intellectual property policy, and then in 2015, 2014, 2015, we adopted a statewide sort of whole policy sort of that we redid all of our policies it's called TASB but I think it's Texas uh, State School Boards um, and it it uh, it has now put a policy in place that is extremely limiting it views all faculty products as works for hire um, essentially anything you produce using um, any kind of um, support from the, the college, and that could be your computer, it could be on-campus Wi-Fi. If you use any of that stuff, uh, anything that you create is property of the college, according to the policy. So I'm talking to some people, we think this is, I think it's a barrier to innovation, as well as certainly OER, and so we're trying to get that changed, and that's kind of a, a slow process, but um, that's a big thing. Um, for us. Yeah, and I, I, I think that that is, uh, you know, an issue that everyone potentially will face at some point, you know, when we when we're talking about an initiative that is whether it's something, you know, that comes from the top down or it's something that swells from the ground um, or both. The truth is, is that a change in leadership or a change in, you know, a major change in policy like that can have an enormous impact and you can't always plan for that. And that that 
brings to my attention something that um, I had spoken with, you know, Quill, you had mentioned um, in, in a previous conversation, you had mentioned the importance of that supporting documentation. So I was wondering if you would be willing to kind of uh, stress or, or go into some detail on what you see as the need, what you mean by supporting documentation and kind of what you, why you see that as so important. So I think um, so much of the OER effort at the institutions that I've worked for is really rested in, um, you know, it's a ground up process where the faculty kind of take ownership of it. But without, in, without leadership, meaning um, administrative support at the top, um, it can fall apart or become very easily something that happens in specialized places within the institution. So like, um, the institution I work at right now has been doing OER for over 10 years in the math department, but not beyond the math department um, or in very small pockets beyond the math department until leadership said, this is something we do want to support the faculty in and we're going to build an infrastructure to support it. Um, and as part of building that infrastructure, I, it's partially capturing the reason why we made the decisions we made to do the things we did. And um, so decisions around why did this, uh, I mentioned that our intellectual property policy is in our faculty negotiated contract. So that contract gets renegotiated periodically. In fact, we're in negotiations right now. So if somebody isn't, if somebody in the administration isn't capturing the reason why we put the language we put in the policy, the way we put it in there, it'll be forgotten in a couple of years and it could disappear on us um, because it could easily just get negotiated out um, or um, if we don't have a reasoning behind the stipends we pay or the reason why the administration put it into a strategic plan it could easily get taken out um, and that, that has happened at the institution I worked at previously they've been through um, two executive vice presidents of instruction which is where a lot of the initial support for the um, for the project started and it changed the face of their OER project, not in negative ways all the time, but um, it helps if the, your, your champions can tell why they're champions and share that reasoning. Um, and that's just a sustainability thing. So the next person to come along understands why it's so culturally important at your institution. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think that I also think of this as, you know, in our situation here, you know, if we have someone come in a place of leadership or if we get new members to our governing board or if we have um, maybe just somebody, for example, very recently we, we found out we're going to have a new, you know, director of IT. And that's a big deal because, you know, we're trying to, you know, we have a commitment from the, we had a commitment from the previous leadership to um, to spend a, a pretty decent chunk of money hosting our Maricopa OER platform. Platform, um, and so you know now we have to kind of you know prepare materials to go and present and try to make the case again. And so having that stuff kind of packaged and ready to go with the um, you know all the you know the numbers that you would need to make the sell and things like that, I, I think is really super important. Um, and I would like to touch on one of the questions that came into the chat in uh, in over the you know last few minutes. Um, one of them said. Um, you know, so when do faculty stipends, uh, you know, when do those no longer become necessary? And, you know, Nathan, you had said that there's a small, a relatively small budget for, for those kinds of things. And it's always kind of tricky to see where we can do that. So I'm just wondering um, what Nathan, you think, or Quill, you can, you can chime in too if you want, but um, how is it that we can start thinking about the OER work outside of special stipends and maybe kind of building it into some of those existing infrastructures already? And that I think goes into our next slide. So what do you think about that, Nathan? Yeah, I think <clears throat> this is a great question. So, um, so I, I see faculty stipends as per, per, um, performing two functions. Um, on the one hand, they're kind of carrots or sweeteners to get people to, to get on board with the initiative. And insofar as that's the case, I do think at some point they, they do end. Um, and I think there's a logic to that end. Um, you know, so for instance, right now we're giving, we've actually decreased our stipends pretty dramatically from the very beginning, but we still offer $300 for the completion of an OER certificate, which is a training program. Maybe that'll continue, but that's not a whole lot 
of, of the budget. Um, the second thing, though, that I think faculty stipends do, and I, I don't think that we should see an end to this, is, is that you know, if we're asking faculty to create resources that, um, like, that I, I think in some sense that needs to be compensated. So if it's not through some tenure and promotion process where a faculty member can receive um, the benefits of having actually contributed scholarly work to uh, the OER, to, to developing OER, then um, I think it, it does make sense to have uh, some stipend procedure that, that sort of at least acknowledges that you know labor has been spent on the this um, on these products and that 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 you know there should be a, some kind of a grant or program system. I think that's actually something that we wouldn't that I wouldn't want to see end. Yeah. Okay. Um, but to get to, uh, you did ask a question about um, the some sort of integrating with other things and on the same same topic. Um, so when I developed our OER certificate training program, I intentionally um, align this with existing training programs that are in our CTLE, our Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence. So, so faculty complete a number of courses that are already in that program, and then they just do a couple of courses in OER, and that's the certificate. So, so my, from my perspective, like OER becomes stronger the more it's sort of embedded in other systems that already exist in the institution. Absolutely. So Quill, I will ask you directly, I mean, you know, when do you think faculty stipends will become no longer necessary or do you want to, do you think that they should stick around? So um, I have, a, I'm very conflicted on this issue, so I'll be honest, because I think, um, I think the faculty stipends don't cover the amount of effort and work that faculty put into designing OER um, or even into adopting OER into existing classes. Um, I just don't think that they, they cover enough. On the other hand, they are a very useful tool for the institution recognizing that this is a special effort. Um, and, and I'm a big fan of noticing special effort. So um, I, I think this plays into embedding OER into existing structures, for example. Um, and, and it goes in, there's a couple of ways I talk about it. So for part of it is, you know, how does OER play into tenure and promotion? Um, and can that be one of the kind of sweeteners to encourage people to think about OER? How do we think about part-time faculty who have or are using OER in our current classes and the longevity of their employment? Um, how can we ensure that the people who commit to lower costs for students and commit to better learning experiences for students, assuming we can prove that, um, how do we commit to those people always getting the classes that we have committed to them um, so they don't get bumped? Um, those kinds of institutional practices are things that we can shift to help make the stipend less necessary. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that we should be talking about at our institutions. And I think it's an institutional question around, you know, how do our policies support OER that makes it possible for us to, um, to kind of rethink the purpose of a stipend. Um, and I think I'm not sure that I know the full answer to that. I don't, I still find stipends incredibly useful <laughs> as, as a, a tool. The other thing I wanted to say about stipends though, is that they can be detrimental in other cases. So for example, um, I have full-time faculty at our institution have an opportunity to take, um, to request, um, sabbaticals to work on specific special projects. And if I'm setting a stipend amount at a, a dollar amount that's way less than a faculty, you know, um, release time, then when they ask for sabbaticals to do OER, we have to turn them down because we have a stipend in place that makes it um, like, well, we can pay you the stipend instead, um, which means that it disincentivizes some faculty who believe that they need more time and they would like a full, you know, um, to create OER. 
that is that I think that that is uh, very interesting. The idea that you have almost competing incentives and uh, trying to balance those. And we've had ongoing discussions for years, actually, um, at Maricopa about, you know, what is the appropriate amount of money or the appropriate amount of release time to give somebody to create or to remix OER. And we've kind of um, eventually kind of come to a set of policies that we said we haven't really made official across the district, but we've kind of implemented at, at least at Scottsdale Community College for reassigned time to differentiate between, you know, uh, workloads. So like if it's just maintaining a template course versus, you know, building a new course, but using, you know, remixing OER that already exists, or if it's just authoring from scratch, you know, so we kind of have those tiers. But um, I, I wanted to kind of just kind of bring together a few different threads here because you know we were talking about uh, the financial aspect and I think it's clear based on this discussion that you know infrastructure and financial sustainability obviously there's a lot of overlap you know um, and one of the other questions that came up in the chat window earlier had to do with you know is there a way to demonstrate the return on investment right because you know uh, we want to be able to show I think that uh, you know there is you know, it's worthwhile to invest in, you know, faculty development or invest in the development of the OER. And it's when you have that um, prepared that you can actually make the case easily. When you have that documentation prepared, you can really demonstrate that return on investment. So if there is somebody who is skeptical of, uh, of a stipend or a skeptical of the, the, the benefit of having that funding available, then you can try to make the case. And I think that has a lot to do with um, kind of the other idea of strategic planning. And I believe actually the next slide specifically addresses um, another connection that I think is important to note. So there was another question in the chat a few minutes ago. Uh, Matthew, about yeah. Do you mind if I just, can I just address that previous question that you, you highlighted, yes. which I yeah, think please do. on the return on investment. So <clears throat> I put a, an article in there from um, in the chat from the EPAA, um, which is an article by David Wiley and some others on um, the Tidewater program. And they propose a model for return on investment. They call it the intro model. Basically, it says that um, there's evidence to suggest that when students take an OER course, they actually take, um, they have a higher enrollment intensity during the term in which they take OER courses. So that means that, um, that there are additional tuition dollars that actually come back to the college or university. Um, and similarly, because students drop at lower rates, um, typically with OER courses, um, the lower withdrawal rates actually also increase, increases tuition dollars. And so the argument is that actually, um, this inc increased tuition revenue from having a an OER project uh, pays for any loss of revenue you'd see from the bookstore or anything else. And then and then the other thing I just point to is I also shared a little um, a Lumen Learning and Analytics. So David basically took the research that he did and like built it into a cool, handy little web tool where you can enter in different parameters and it returns like a, a result. So it tells you sort of how much more money you might expect to get from an OER program and how much you would be saving students and kind of all these really cool like financial metrics that come out at the end. So play with that and, and I would really encourage people to, to think along those lines when, when talking to their, um, when to, to administrators. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think that, that that's, I mean, that's a great tool um, and it really does, you know, give us a way, I, I, it's, you know, trying to make it easy to tell the story is always, you know, a challenge. And, you know, if you want people to do something, you want to try to make it easy. So when there is a tool like that available um, for people like me who have, you know, studied literature and aren't necessarily good at, you know, cr uh, crunching the numbers, I think that that's very, very uh, helpful, I think. Um, so thank you for that. And Nathan, I, I did want to um, actually ask you this uh, but definitely, Quill, I want to hear from you as well. Um, so going back to the connections between a general strategic plan and the, 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 the idea that, you know, any change in leadership or a change in um, not necessarily uh, OER leadership, right, because Nathan, you're an OER coordinator. Uh, obviously, you know, 
you're you're not going to do it forever. I know that my my job as the OER coordinator is limited to two to three years, so that there is um, so that there is the some consistency. You know, there's time to develop a project, but at the same time, there is you know at some point the baton is going to be passed on to somebody else. So. Um, how is it, Nathan, that you are looking ahead in terms of, um, you know, succession, basically? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the first thing we're going to do is try to, we are going through a strategic planning process right now. So we're trying to get OER into the strategic plan. And the ways I'm thinking about that right now is trying to not make OER kind of a primary pillar of the strategic plan, but actually to embed it into um, student success um, and um, and institutional efficiency and lowering barriers and cost to students. So that there may be other headings that that sort of the the OER projects fit into. And what's nice about that, and to, this kind of goes to the um, sustainability and succession issue, is that once you have items in your strategic plan, often your budgeting process is going to be aligned with the strategic planning process, or at least hopefully that's something like that is going on at your institution. So if you have OER embedded in that way, then you, you are going to see, you know, dollars come through. As far as people are concerned, I think it's a huge issue. I mean, I think in academia, everybody is, has had the experience of losing a champion at the vice president or you know, dean level or something like that, and and then you know, getting someone else in place that um, that may not share the objectives that you had previously. I think it's a it's it's a major a major issue. Um, so um, I think the important the, the thing that I'm doing is trying to build like a as broad a team of people as I can that are all knowledgeable about OER. So I'm trying to get a group of faculty. A, a whole set of deans, you know, people from student services, all sorts of people. So we have a pretty broad cross-disciplinary team that's part of a OER steering committee. And then like at Open Ed Week last week, we, I mean, Open Ed, sorry, Open Ed Conference last week, we brought, I think, nine people to the conference. So, you know, when faculty go to that conference or, or go to a big conference like that, they get energized and informed and they become the kind of champions on campus that you need so my hope is that you know we get a broad team that's that's in engaged in this and I definitely have I don't have a limit on my term on my uh, on my position like you do Matthew but I definitely have in mind that that you know a sort of sunset where I'm gonna walk away and so and I think it's really helpful to do that because you don't want to be the only OER our go-to person because that puts you in a bad spot it puts the institution in a bad spot you want to have you want that to be a successive um, sort of position that other people could take on um, yeah so and then also you know if you create policies and documentations that make it all really clear the next person that comes on board you know they're gonna have that in place so that, that I think is really another piece of this excellent and quill um, what, what are your thoughts about leadership su succession I think Nathan said it all pretty well. I think um, for us, uh, one of the things that kind of thinking about leadership and succession that also really helps is if we can institutionalize some of that leadership in ways. Like for example, our steering committee is now an official committee on our institution, which was a big process to go through. But that means that it's always staffed and, and there's specific people. Um, there's like you know, I always have to have a member of the union on that, on the steering committee, and they select who that member is. So it becomes part of a task that another group is responsible for um, that kind of builds in some capacity for com a complete team always. You know, the student government is always no nominating somebody. Um, and our student leadership changes all the time. So part of the way I think about leadership succession is thinking in terms of those students who leave regularly and how do they maintain their advocacy? Um, because, you know, we may have, they, they usually are in a leadership position for a year before they're moving to another institution. So how do they talk to each other and how can I get their voice to like continue and trickle throughout the generations of students? Um, 
And I just can't stress the importance of, sometimes I get so caught up in doing the work that I forget to document why we're doing the work and the, and the kind of successes of the work. Absolutely. Challenges we face, because it's so easy to get caught up in just doing the work. And so I, I can't stress how important it is to really continue to say, to document why we're making the decisions we're making. Because like Nathan, you know, I don't want to be the only person at my institution who understands all of who we are at our institution. I would like it to be a community process where there's lots of people involved in making decisions. And I think that this, uh, you know, thank you both of you for for these i think very wise comments about uh, um about leadership succession and i know that in my situation it's been clear from the beginning when i took the the role as the oer coordinator that um it wasn't going to be and i'm kind of glad i mean i don't necessarily i'm not sure that it would it, that i would like to stop teaching you know um forever so uh it you know it's kind of nice that i knew that there was going to be this um you know this sunset to that my my participation in that role but it's also given me the opportunity to immediately start thinking about you know who, who is on the bench i noticed somebody in the chat window kind of brought up the metaphor having a deep bench you know and it's totally true uh and and nathan when you said bringing a team to the open education conference and really exposing them having having uh you know giving people who are maybe a little bit newer to uh oer and open education and giving them the opportunity to network and and to really get inspired by some of the brilliance that's in this in this community i think is what um it can be extremely meaningful because i had a similar experience last week we brought um we brought a couple of people from our team who had never gone to the open education conference before and um they you know, I, I we'll see what happens, but you know, it seemed to be somewhat transformative um, in in terms of inspiring them to um, to want to you know be even more involved. And having a team is super important. You know, Maricopa is a district with ten colleges, and so you know, one of my tasks as the coordinator is to kind of get people to work together as much as possible. And it's absolutely vital to have as many representatives from each of those colleges as possible. So if you have multiple campuses or if you have, you know, departments and divisions that are somewhat isolated or siloed from each other, then it's it's really crucial to kind of get in there and find out where the excitement is or where the OER usage is so that you know who your people are um, that you can kind of tap into when you are thinking about moving on um, and I, it's not my intention to just talk all about myself because I want to move on to another question but I also wanted to add one thing about the succession the way that our OER coordinator um, assignment it's Nathan it's like yours it's full reassigned time for faculty um, but the way that it works for us is that there's going to be a one semester overlap so the 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 sixth semester that I am, you know, in my final semester as OER coordinator, whoever it is that's going to take over after me is going to be working with me that semester so that we can kind of ensure consistency. Um, and that way it's not like I just, you know, drop the baton and let someone pick it up and move on. That way there's there's kind of the sense that, yeah, somebody new is coming on, they might have their own kind of unique vision for what the future looks like, but there's still going to be that sense of consistency there. That's a great idea. I'm taking that one down and bringing it back to my team. Right on. Okay. Well, so the next question, I don't if and I don't know maybe the question came up in the chat here. Yes. And so Quill said um the recognizing efforts. I want to Note that uh, one of the the third topic, we're still in the second topic. This is pretty weighty, I guess. But the third topic has to do with culture. Uh, and, and the question that we're going to address a little bit later in this discussion, just a few minutes actually, uh, is re directly related to how we tell our story, how we celebrate our achievements and those kinds of things. And I think that it will be important to keep that in mind as well because, you know, there's a lot of overlap here. Um, I did want to bring up a a kind of a potentially difficult point that some people might, um, you know, it's always challenging technology. We love it and we rely on it and then things change and, you know, technology invariably, you know, breaks at some point. So um, I'm just curious to know, um, maybe Quill, if you want to start out first on this one, but uh, so how have decisions about technology use contributed to or detracted from the sustainability of OER at your institution? I could write you a book if you want on this topic. 
Well, we'll just go with a, with a short set of answers. If, if, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Um, because I'm, I'm challenged by this one. Um, it, it, for f financial sustainability and kind of that, honestly, technology and, and purchasing technology or investing in platforms is a very um, time-consuming and expensive process in any public institution in my state. So um, to that end, we've made a series of decisions to use the things that are most easy, like our learning management system and an agreement we have with Lumen Learning, which is great in terms of ease of access and getting resources to students and, and adopting OER as quickly as we can. However, I kind of regret some of those decisions not to go through the difficult process earlier because, you know, we were kind of flowing like water and every rock we ran into technology wise, we just flowed around it by using some, by finding an existing tool that um, made it easy for us to make adoptions fast. Um, the problem with that is long term, um, our learning management system hosts most of our OER and that is not sharing with the comments. It is not accessible to students when they're not in our classes anymore. It is not accessible to students who, or to people outside of our institution without a lot of, of back channel discussion. Um, it makes it hard for faculty who are teaching at multiple institutions to move things around. Um, so I am thinking, Sustainability wise, it was a good decision at the time in terms of we can afford this, let's move forward. And it got us the most adoptions fastest. However, now thinking of long term viability and strength of our OER movement, I really wish that we had invested some more um, in um, technology. So we're looking at that again as an institution. That's excellent. Um, so so we've got, uh, if there's somebody that's got your mic on, it might, if it would be great if you could mute that because I hear some typing. But um, so, but I, I just wanted to touch on that. It's super, it's exactly the same thing that Maricopa is going through. And Nathan, I, I think that you have uh, some thoughts about this as well. Um, you know, we are dealing with the, the same situation. We developed a bunch of courses over the course of five years, and most of those courses are in Canvas because that was what was most convenient for our faculty. It was our learning management system. It's easy for people to use. It was a good way for us to, um, you know, build, you know, kind of a base of people using OER at the institution. Um, but then Quill, like you said, it's not necessarily uh, sharing with the commons. It's not necessarily, um, you know, releasing that R in the care framework, which I think is is a really big focus for us. You know, as we move forward, we're trying to think of ways to use the care framework to um, evaluate our interactions with OER as much as we're using it to evaluate what the vendors may be doing who are who are coming to us. And that's one of the challenges that we have moving forward is, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of balancing what's best for our uh, institution or what's best for our faculty with what is actually going to be contributing to um, the global open education movement. And so, Nathan, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so I just shared the link to the CARE framework for those who are unfamiliar with it. It's a really useful um, sort of well framework for understanding um, how to be a good OER steward, how to how to best serve the community, the commons, the, the general production of knowledge. Um, so we are definitely, I think in many ways, we're very similar to what Quill was saying. Like um, we wanted to get started. We wanted to get started quickly. So we had a, uh, a partnership with Lumen Learning. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of options out there. You know, I know Top Hat does institutional partnerships and other, there are other things. These are, I want to say that they're very useful for, for at least uh, two reasons. Um, one is you're going to have faculty, if you want to make OER a, a part of education at your institution, um, you're going to have faculty who are, who need the sort of wraparound support in a courseware platform where everything's sort of put together for them. And um, developing that on your own is probably not worth the effort. I'm not sure. Um, you know, the there um, if people need that stuff i think it's probably best to to use a third party for that 
but then it costs money. And then you got to figure out, well, how are you going to pay for that? Are you going to make the students pay for it? Um, which, which may be okay. I mean, just open doesn't mean free. Or are you going to create institutional structures to pay for it? That's, that's a t difficult choice. Um, we are doing some stuff through the LMS. One of the good things, because we're a Canvas institution, we do have the capacity to share those resources um, through the Canvas Commons, which is a limited sharing. Um, we have a course certification process that faculty can go through, so they get their course reviewed. We make sure it vets on all copyright, uh, cop sorry, copyright issues, and then we we give it a, a Creative Commons license and share it into the Canvas Commons. The next step that we really want to think about doing is getting a, getting cartridges and, and putting them on the open web. So I'm working with a librarian who's kind of got a, a little bit of a repository for us for that. We looked into actually getting a, like purchasing a repository that would help us host a bunch of OER materials. And I mean, it's, you can find some that are reasonably priced, but even a reasonably priced repository, you're talking a few tens of thousands of dollars to get uh, for an annual subscription. And, and that's another cost that you're gonna have to bear. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, those are the main things that I would say as far as technology um, is concerned. I mean, um, uh, one, one other thing that we do have, which is really cool, we, we use a Kaltura web video hosting platform. Um, we call it EduTube. And it has a nice, it's, an, it's on the open web, so anybody can access it. And it also has um, licensing in, embedded, so you can Creative Commons license your own instructional videos. And that's super nice. I think the thing that we're missing, and I, it's just going to be a, I think it's just going to be a labor of practice that we get through is going to be, you know, getting that stuff and then, you know, putting it on OER Commons or some other, or, you know, sharing with the open textbook network, network or whatever, you know, you got that next step to get it onto another more public platform that uh, gives other people access to it. I think that's also important. And Nathan, I think one of the things that you just brought up, which is super important too, is, and this fits into the whole discussion basically, but having a process by which the material that you're producing actually is kind of vetted and certified. Um, it's something that we're working on here because we had been funding courses and, and primarily trying to get faculty to adopt those courses themselves and then maybe have some kind of impact in their department or across the college uh, or between colleges. And, you know, we've seen some of that impact, but we want to be able to go back through now and really ensure that, um, you know, we're actually taking a four pronged approach moving forward. And I'm sure that you have something along these lines embedded, but in, in your review process, Process, but we're looking at um, the four different categories for the content review are um, accessibility, instructional design, um, licensing, and content quality. So we want to get like content experts and accessibility experts and whatnot and try to hit it from all four of those angles. And once we actually have that review process in place, uh, we're going to codify it and, and, you know, produce that documentation so that hopefully it will, you know, be sustained into the future and something that we can continue to, to work on. Okay, well, this is good. We're getting close to the end here, but we still have, you know, a whole other topic to talk about, but I think there's only one question in that topic. Infrastructure is so important. I mean, you can't sustain anything without that, right? So, um, keep in mind that I am doing my best to try to keep here, um, see, I think of Canvas as the most share, um, sherry LMS. Okay, yeah. So this is a great question from Amy Hofer Quill. Do you want to answer that um, directly, asking why it is that sure. Canvas doesn't really meet those needs? Yeah, I'm going to use her metaphor. I was just typing up an answer here. Um, yeah, so Canvas is the most sherry of the LMSs, um, but like a garden, a secret garden is still a secret garden. Um, and so if people don't know it's there or have to go through multiple, if I'm not at a Canvas institution and I want to access the Canvas Commons, I have to know that I can use a Canvas for Teacher account. I have to know how to find it. And I have to know um, then how to use, search the Commons once I'm there, which isn't always the easiest thing in the world. Um, so it's not exactly the most, it, it's, it's more, it, it's easier to share on Canvas than it is on a lot of other LMSs. But it's still like you have to know the secret key. You have to be in the right place when the wind blows and looking. Has anybody seen this regarding that movie where she's looking and the wind's blowing? Anyway, 
um, you have to be in the right place to, to, use, to use the Canvas Commons effectively. Um, and then the other reason is really the students do not have access to Canvas Commons. They don't know what it is, they don't know how to use it, and when they're done with my class, um, if it's a, a Creative Commons, if it's a class that I intend to share with them over time, they don't really have that access because our LMS, you know, cuts them off at a certain point because they're no longer our student. So um, then they don't have access to those materials later. That means they can't use the fifth R. Thank you. Thank you very much, Quill. I think that that definitely does a good job of explaining some of the um, you know, just problematic aspects of using any learning management system, but even Canvas. And I agree, Canvas, we shared all of our stuff on Canvas Commons. We have, um, it's M-M-O-E-R is the tag, Miracle of Millions O-E-R. Um, and you'll find like 17 different courses on there that we've developed. And, and But yeah, it's not, we have to, if you're an OER practitioner as individual faculty, you kind of have to encourage your students to download the content so that they can retain it um, because it, it will be difficult for them to access it in the future. And, and like you said, um, you have to know that it's there. You have to know to look and to create a free account and everything. So it's not ideal, but um, it is, it's, a, it's working at least a little bit for now. Um, so one other thing, we'll move on. If there are any other questions, feel free to put them on there and um, I will do my best to try to respond to those. But I want to address our third topic before we're done here. And the third topic is um, about the cultural sustainability of, of OER. And I know that we could talk about this forever, but we've already addressed a lot of these things. And I was hoping that um, maybe uh, Quill, if you wanted to, or Nathan, uh, talk about just really briefly, how do you measure and communicate in, uh, program impact and support of sustainability? Now, I know this is a huge uh, question and you could probably we could probably spend an entire webinar just talking about this but just very briefly what do you think are one or two uh, extremely important things to consider when talking about sustaining the culture um, that's necessary to support OER let's say quill if you want to go first <laughs> okay sure <laughs> Um, so I, I think first it's most, it's really important to make connections with an institutional research team. Um, and the reason for that is because they can help me think of ways to measure the impact of the program. Um, so I sometimes have questions I want to ask, like what is the student success rate and what's their, their success of pass rate in next classes after they take an OER course. Um, and those are really good questions to ask, but sometimes, um, I need people who are there who can say, this is the appropriate way to answer, ask this question. Um, so I lean on my institutional research team a lot um, and, and they have this tendency to say, let the data tell the story. So we look for data and then find the story that it tells. And then I share that story. And I share it in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's in conference presentations. Sometimes it's in webinars like these. Sometimes it's just in a quick email to my institutional leadership that says, hey, this cool thing happened. Um, so I think um, that can be really useful. Sometimes I, I will, this has been something we've been doing recently and it's part of our ATB work. Um, as an institution, we try to give all of our faculty all the data at all times so they can always be examining their own experiences. So I have been doing small workshops with faculty where we show up with data from their own classes and ask them to measure and discuss with each other um, what they're doing with OER that may or may not be moving a needle in terms of closing the um, achievement gap. Um, and it's a really fun workshop. It's really hard because most people find thing, out things about their data that they don't like, but it's really good for building this culture of inquiry as an institution. Excellent. And, and weaving that into the message or the narrative that you're going to then present in order to demonstrate the return on investment and demonstrate the um, work that you're doing for your community. Nathan, I was curious to know um, in the short time we have left, you know, what would you say would be the number one tip that you have to share with everyone about communicating? How do you communicate that impact and to whom are you communicating it? I wish I knew. <laughs> so, uh, I think you've got to have a multi-pronged approach. I mean, I think one form of communication does not work. Um, there's not one form of communication. Communication is a process. 
So I love uh, Quill's idea of thinking about data as telling a story and then also thinking about personalizing that um, approach to data. I think that's huge. Um, I would also, so we've done a couple of things. So we have a public facing website. We've developed an internal facing website just for faculty. Um, I can post news items to our, uh, to our news bulletin. I have um, a huge communication list. Like I've, I set up a database of basically everybody who comes to a workshop or seminar or anything that I interact with, I put them on a spreadsheet and I have their, you know, their campus location, their contact information and the discipline they teach in. And so anytime I'm getting stuff, I shoot out blast emails to specific groups. Like if I'm going to do a workshop at a campus, I'll send everyone an email a week in advance and say, I'm coming to your campus for this thing. Make sure you're there mm -hmm. if you want to learn more. Um, and then, but I think culture shift is a, is just, is a much deeper thing. And I think it, it comes back to making it fun, celebrating success, um, understanding that, that this aligns with our mission and values and, you know, building that team of people who can be champions. And, you know, hopefully over time you get to a place where you become like a vibrant OER institution right now, HCC, I, we have some great champions, but we're not there. Like most of my time I think is, is trying to figure out where the blockages are. We have, I think people, mainly people in like sort of um, middle and se middle to senior leadership who are sort of discreetly behind the scenes, you know, kind of um, pushing back on this. And I think it's a sort of this detective work and also sort of persuasive work of just kind of trying to figure out where those problems are and address them and try to slowly sort of try to move it. But that's really, that's kind of where we are right now. That's excellent. So the so the brief answer to, I think to the question of like you know how how do you best communicate and to whom and I think that your answer basically was like all the communication. We want all the communication to everyone all the time. Um, and I, yeah, and I, it's true. I mean, and I saw in the uh, in the chat somebody mentioned you know board of trustees and and knowing where the power is and 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 being able to communicate with them. And I'll just say that Maricopa Millions in the fall. I'm sorry, last spring, uh, which was the end of the initial five-year run of Maricopa Millions in the beginning of our transition, um, you know, we ha they had a huge, they hosted a huge event and we had the chancellor and we had the provost and we had the governing board, at least one member of the governing board there. And it was an opportunity to really publicly and in a big way, unveil the student savings and celebrate it. And we gave out gifts, these little power banks, you know, you can charge your cell phones and they say OER hero charging into the future with OER. So there's the, just like a little kind of a token gift that is actually somewhat meaningful. And it really made people feel like, you know, they had been part of meaningful work. And I think that that that, uh, that celebration is vital. Um, and then touching on to what Quill said as well, you know, it's sometimes hard to take the find the time because you're so busy doing the work that finding the time to write up a narrative about it is like, you know, it seems like it seems like, um, you know, just an additional layer uh, of task, but it is very vital to tell the story. So um, this is great we're pretty much at the end right here and i need to basically just tell you that at this point hold on what's going on here oh now i'm editing my slide okay that didn't work i'm gonna just go to get involved to see um uh you know what's happening we have our community email if you're not part of that then absolutely get on there because tons of resources are shared on there on a regular basis and um, it is a really great resource. Our next webinar is coming up November 14th. Um, it's going to be on transforming learning with open educational practices and pedagogy, which is super interesting if you aren't real familiar with it. Um, Dr. Michael Mills from Professor Shinta, uh, Professor Shinta Hernandez from Montgomery College will be speaking, as well as uh, Dr. Karen Ken. Kangelosi, uh, professor of biology at Keene State College. And so register for that and keep that on your calendar. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, we have one minute to answer them. Um, let's see. I don't know. I would just say thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for joining us and for listening to us talk. And please have a wonderful day.